the different length scales of the different size eddies. So, before going to a formal assessment using the scaling relationships that we have established, maybe let us now lo look into uh, some visual uh, demonstrations of how these eddies might look like. So, just look into these, some of these are simulated flows, but just look into the rotating structures and uh, you will see that these rotating structures are having a wide range of length scales. So, if you see that they are really having a wide range of length scales and they fluctuate over a wide range of time scales. <coughs> so, we will just go on uh, looking into some of these types of uh, visual demonstrations to figure out the roles played by the eddies. So, just see the roles played by the eddies which are not there in the laminar flow. So, these eddies are turbulent eddies. <coughs> Maybe couple of more ones. So, this is a three dimensional visualization. So, all these have been generated by computer simulation. Uh, so, uh, you can see uh, visualize the structure of these eddies. So, we will just pass it a bit fast and uh, try to figure out. So, this if you want to see the eddies in different planes. So, you can see that the structure in eddy structure of the eddy is changing from one plane to the other. So, it clearly gives us an indication that there is nothing called a two dimensional turbulent flow. Turbulent flow is always three dimensional and unsteady fundamentally. So, that is the first understanding that we develop out of this. So, at all different sections and at all different planes, you see these different uh, characteristics of this rotating structures. And these rotating structures are continuously evolving with time, that is also one of the important things. So, you have not only a wide range of length scales, but a wide range of time scales and we will try to have an estimate of these ranges of length scales and time scales. So, uh, the whole idea of this understanding was to have an appreciation that you may have wides of uh, wide range length scales of the eddies. And to quantify that, let us say that we are now interested to get a feel of the difference between the system length scale and the Kolmogorov length scale or the smallest eddy length scale. So, the system length scale or the largest eddy length scale uh, sometimes known as integral length scale. So, let us see that what is this. So, if let us say that L is of the order of 1 meter, this is an example. Just we are trying to take good numbers so that uh, we come up with e easy estimates. So, the system length scale say you have a 1 meter system length scale, the largest eddy is also of that length scale. Let us say that the Reynolds number is uh, in that is 10 to the power 4. So, then what will be eta? So, 1 meter into Reynolds number to the power minus 3 fourth. So, 1 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter. Right? So, if you make the Reynolds number larger and larger, the disparity between L and eta becomes more and more. 10,000 is not a very large Reynolds number, it is just like uh, moderately large. So, when you if you make the Reynolds number really very, very large, this disparity will be more and more and you have eddies at almost all intermediate length scales between these. So, that is what we say that the existence of multiple length scales or not only multiple a wide range of length scales differing in order of magnitude by at least 1000, uh, so you see the order of magnitude difference. Similarly, if you look into the time scales and the velocity scales. So, the velocity scale in the smallest eddy. So, velocity scale in the smallest eddy, how do you estimate? The velocity scale is of the order of nu by eta. 
from the Reynolds number scale equal to 1. So, the kinematic viscosity it is roughly like say 10 to the power minus 6 meter square per second for water mu by rho 10 to the power minus 3 divided by 10 to the power 3. And if you take eta as say 10 to the power minus 3 meter, then you come up with a V of the order of 10 to the power minus 3 meter per second. These are small velocities. And not only that, if you look into the system scale velocity that is quite large. So, the system scale velocity that is u naught that is governed by the system scale Reynolds number and that is quite large. The time scale, so the time scale for the system it is L by u naught or the large large eddy for the large eddy is of the order of L by u naught and for the small eddy that is the Kolmogorov time scale. So, this V is Kolmogorov velocity scale. So, if you consider the time scale for the small eddies that is sort of eta by V. So, it is possible to have an estimate of the time scales and the length scales and the velocity scales. The other important aspect of the large eddy and the small eddies or the distinctive aspect is that the large eddies have a sort of directionality or a directional preference because they are large and they have some uh, preferred directions over which they have their activities. On the other hand, smallest eddies have no directional preference and the distinction therefore is that the largest eddies are very much anisotropic. So, they do not have, uh, they do not have like uh, isotropy or a direction independence type of behavior. On the other hand, if you go to smallest eddies, they are virtually isotropic. So, they are, uh, it is not that they are actually isotropic, but they are approximately very, very much isotropic. So, the transition of paradigm from the largest eddy to smallest eddy is also in the form of a uh, big anisotropy to a reasonably good state of isotropy. And that is possible because the eddies will tend to become more and more isotropic as and when they are able to dissipate uh, whatever energy is, is being transferred to them through viscous effects because viscous effects sort of tries to e equilibrate it in all possible directions. So, uh, viscous effects are stronger and stronger for smaller and smaller eddies and that is why as you go towards smaller and smaller eddies, the dissipation effect makes it more and more isotropic or direction independent. Now, uh, we will try to understand another important thing that see these eddies are having rotations and when they have rotations, they must have vorticities. So, we will try to see that how these vorticities evolve for these eddies. We will try to develop a sort of governing equation for vorticity and we will try to understand that qualitatively by understanding the relative uh, interaction between the large eddies and small eddies and so on. So, let us say that we, we start with uh, the vector form of the Navier-Stokes equation. So, let us say that we have rho So, this is like the momentum equation in a vector form which we derived. Now, what we are interested to do is to get expressions for vorticity out of that. So, we know that vorticity is the curl of the velocity vector. So, let us take curl of both sides of this equation so that we have a chance of coming up with the vorticity. So, just take curl of both sides. So, if you take the curl of both sides, then what happens? first term so carl is a is a vector operator with respect to the spatial gradients 
So, with respect to time you may just take it inside outside without any problem. Then Okay. So, now let us try to simplify this. So, for simplifying this clearly we understand that this is equal to the vorticity vector let us call it zeta. There is another term which we can of course, this is also zeta there is another term which we can clearly simplify what is this? This is 0 like this is the curl of gradient of a scalar. So, curl of gradient of a scalar by a vector identity this is 0. So, we have now to concentrate on this term. So, it is curl of now let us write u dot del u. So, what is this? This is by the vector identity this one right. So, this just we have written the vector identity. So, when we have written this vector identity, so let us first consider the first term. So, this is like this is a scalar u square by 2 uh, or just u square. So, when you write, so this is a dot product of a vector with a vector right. So, when you when you write this one important thing that you are getting out of this is whatever it is, it is a scalar. So, you have curl of gradient of a scalar. So, the first term becomes 0. Therefore, this boils down to minus of curl of this one because this is the vorticity vector. And this is as good as So, the left hand side becomes what rho one of the terms that is this term we retain in the left hand side the other term we bring in the right hand side. So, the right hand side becomes So, can you identify what is what is the term which is there in the square bracket in the left hand side? This is the capital DDT of zeta, the total derivative of zeta. So, we can write the, so we have got a transport equation of vorticity by starting with the Navier-Stokes equation and uh, let us just write it in terms of the kinematic viscosity. If you divide both the sides by the density, then you have this one is equal to So, you can clearly see that 
this is what if you have a vortex element that is an element within which there are elements of vorticities then this vortex element may have a change in vorticity. So, the total derivative is representing what this is a change in vorticity of an element because of a combined effect of change in time and change in position in going to a different place where the velocity field is different. Therefore, it is subjected to a different velocity gradient at a new location. And with respect to time also there has been a change the total effect is a combination. Yes. Sorry, 1 by rho, right. So, the total derivative of the vorticity is what? You have one term in the right hand side, this is uh, quite straightforward to understand, that is the second term. The second term represents what? It represents the viscous dissipation of vorticity, so to say. So, there is some total rate of change of vorticity, it is related to something which is viscous dissipation, but something else also which is not viscous dissipation. And we will try to understand that what is this something else or what is the implication of this term. And that we will do in a very simple and qualitative manner. So, when we do it in a simple and qualitative manner, <coughs> we will again go back to the picture of the large eddies and the small eddies. <coughs> so, when you have a large eddy, for a large eddy the Reynolds number is large, right. So, for a large eddy the inertia force is much much greater than the viscous force. For smaller eddies the viscous forces are also there. Now, if you just simply in a rough way model an eddy, you can say that a vortex element the rate of change of angular momentum of a vortex element let us say i omega. When we say the total rate of the rate of change it is like we are writing the total derivative because the rate of change may be because of many things. So, this is as if we are tracking a fluid element which is going from one place to the other because of change in time and change in position combined effect is the some net rate of change of angular momentum and that must be equal to the viscous the torque due to viscous forces. So, here because whatever force what we are seeing uh, what we are seeing is a torque uh, is a is a viscous force that is what is a forcing parameter. So, this you can write as i d omega d t plus omega d i d t is equal to the viscous torque. I am just writing it symbolically. Therefore, d omega d t is equal to minus omega by i d i d t. plus viscous torque by I. Okay. Let us consider the large eddies. So, what happens for the large eddies? Those are very special cases when the viscous effects are very, very negligible because for the large eddies the Reynolds number is very large. So, for the large eddies the angular momentum is conserved. Now, when the large eddies are extracting energy from the mean flow what is going to happen? their angular velocity will increase. So, omega will increase, but if i omega has to be conserved then i should decrease. So, i should decrease means their sort of radial length scale should decrease and therefore, if they were more or less the if the large eddies were more or less like this uh, the small eddies uh, I mean the their subsequent transformation to preserve the angular momentum will be of a shape which is if, if you consider this as a radial dimension. This is R 2 say this is R 1. So, R 1 will come down to a lower R 2, but if it is the same large eddy the volume has to be conserved. So, if the radial length scale has decreased the lateral length scale should increase and therefore, the vortex element 
or the eddy has got so called stretched. This is known as vortex stretching. So, vortex stretching vortex stretching is one should not create a uh, misunderstanding that vortex stretching is only for the largest eddy, it is not like that. But we are giving an example of a large eddy where a very large eddy where viscous effects are negligible just to give a clear uh, relationship between what is the change of the moment of inertia, how it is related to the angular velocity. So, if you have now eddies which are rotating at a higher speed, they must sacrifice it in terms of having a lower moment of inertia. So, that i into omega is conserved and when you have that, that means it is sort of stretched to have the same volume, but now with a lower ra radial scale. So, that the moment of inertia is now less. Now, what happens for a case when viscous effects are present qualitatively same, because if you see that when this viscous effects were not there, you see d omega d t. So, d omega d t is the rate of change of the angular velocity and you see that is related to minus of d i d t. So, one in increment is another decrement and now the viscous torque will also play an additional role. Now, if you come back to this equation, see there is a lot of similarity between this equation and this equation. This is a differential equation. This is a very qualitative, this is also like uh, some sort of differential equation, but not rigorously derived. So, it is just by putting terms qualitatively. And what we see here is that if you consider the left hand side, see this is uh, the total derivative of vorticity, this is almost very closely related with the total derivative of the angular velocity, because the angular velocity is half of the vorticity vector. So, these two are related, the viscous terms these are related, therefore, whatever is this term and whatever is this term, these two must be carrying the same meaning. That means, so what does this term indicate? This term represents the effect of vortex stretching. With a larger omega, you have a decrement in i. Therefore, this term in the vorticity transport represents a vortex stretching. So, vortex stretching is one of the very important activities that is taking place in a turbulent flow structure and it can be shown that this effect is important or there only for a flow with a three dimensional structure and a turbulent flow has only a three dimensional structure. It is on an average it might be two dimensional, one dimensional whatever, but fluctuations are there in all possible directions. So, even if the mean flow is 0 in a particular direction, but you still have fluctuations in all possible directions. So, the question is how we quantify these means and the fluctuations. So, the next thing where we will go to is the statistical description of turbulent flows.